All right. The last section that will be on test one Thursday. Today we go over 2.7. Um, Thursday says review on the calendar, but that doesn't mean I say everything from the first three weeks really fast. It means you ask me questions from anywhere you need. Um, remember, there's not only the practice test and momentum, but there are other sheets that if you haven't looked at them until now, but you know you need more practice. For example, on this crazy simplifying expressions from calculus, I have a whole sheet of those its name, Simplifying Expressions from Calculus. So if you need some more um, practice on anything, you let me know and I will get it to you. 2.7 2. is operations on functions. Just like you can add, subtract, multiply, and divide numbers, and you can add, subtract, multiply, and divide algebraic expressions, you can add, subtract, multiply, and divide functions. Why would you want to? Well, for example, I have one answer to that. I don't have lots of answers to that, but one answer to that is in business calculus, we have a revenue function and a cost function. Guess how we get the profit function? Revenue function minus cost function gives you the profit function. So that's just one, and I'm not good at thinking of examples, but that's just one example of why we would want to do algebraic operations on functions. Um, adding, subtracting, multiplying functions, just nothing terribly interesting about it. We're going to do a few examples here. In number six, we have two functions with radicals in them. What's the domain of that first function? f of x equals square root of 5 minus 2x. God whispers and you know the answer, that's fine. If not, how could you find that domain? What has to be true about values? I can't have a negative under the radical. So if I can't just look at that and see the domain, what um, inequality could I solve to find the domain? <laughs> 5 minus 2x has to be greater than, how about equal to? Yes. Yeah, I can take the square root of 0. So 5 minus 2x has to be greater than or equal to 0. That will get the domain for me. When I subtract 5 from both sides, does that reverse the symbol? No. What about when I divide both sides by negative 2? Does that reverse the symbol? Oh, yeah. Don't forget that. X can be anything less than or equal to five halves. Any, many, many, mo, what's your favorite number less than five halves? One, if I let X be one, is that gonna be in the domain of that function? Yeah, what about your most hated number bigger than five halves? Three, if I let X be three, is that gonna be okay? No, that's not. So pretty comfortable. Comfortable with that domain, this one's a little bit easier to squint and see all the x's have to be what? Greater than or equal to negative 3. So we have all the x's less than 2 and a half and all the x's greater than or equal to negative 3 for the domain of those individual functions. Now, um, the A part, does F plus G of X? You write down F of X. And you write down G of X. And you add them together. And if there's any simplifying you can do, you do it. If not, you're through. Can I add those and get, uh, what would that be? 8 minus X? No, oh, I can't do that. I can't do that. I can't add square root of 4 plus square root of 9 and get square root of 13. <laughs> so I can't do it here. I can't do it here. 
the product of those two functions, square root of five minus two X times square root of X plus three, can I multiply two radicands? <coughs> yes, I could, if this is multiplication, I could call that square root of 36 and I get the same answer. So yes, I can simplify that would be square root of, doesn't really matter in what order you write it. Um, in descending order, I'd have a negative 2x squared, and I'd have a 5x minus a 6x, negative 1x plus 15. Let me double check that. Negative 2x squared, 5x minus 6x plus 15. Yep. And then in the next part, f divided by g of x, well, that would just be 5 minus 2x divided by square root of x plus 3. Could I simplify that? Not this particular one. I could put it all as a single fraction under the radical. I could say square root of 5 minus 2x over x plus 3. I wouldn't really call that simpler, though. I don't think they rationalize the denominator here. I don't think so. So if you leave that, that's absolutely fine. Um, what would be the domain of f plus g, f minus g, and f times g? It has to be all the values of x that I can put into both here and I can also put it in here. So if we're looking for the union of everything that's less than or equal to two and a half and everything greater than or equal to negative three, if you shaded the overlapping parts of that number line, Negative three positive five halves. If you shaded everything that was less than or equal to five halves and greater than or equal to negative three, where would you be shading here? In between negative three and two and a half. Is the negative three included? Included there. Is the five halves included? Included there. So the domain of the sum, the difference, and the product is the union of those. Actually, that's intersection. Intersection of those, what they have in common. Um, from negative three to five halves. I didn't type it, but if you just take the answer to this one and put a minus between, that's all you could do. I just didn't type the F minus G. That's the domain of this one and this one. What's going to be the dumb different about the domain of the quotient function? If you oh, have to Same thing, except I can't let the denominator be zero. So I just need a parentheses to not include the negative three. Otherwise, it's the same. Yes, ma'am. Upside down. All right, um, same thing, I guess number eight, nothing different, but it just gives us a little bit of practice um, with rational expressions. F of X equals X over X minus two, what's the domain? Everything but two, you don't have to write that in, you don't have to write that in interval notation for me. What's the domain of g of x? Everything but negative 4. 
uh, we're all numbered, but negative four. So f plus g of x is x over x minus two plus seven x over x plus four. Can you still add rational expressions? Prove it. I just backed up to double check my work and I see a typo, not a typo, but I misadded 4x minus 14x negative 10x. That's why we checked our work. It's okay. <coughs> Anybody second that? Let everybody catch up. You could factor a 2x out of the numerator, but you're not going to have anything that will cancel in the denominator. So it really doesn't matter if you do or not. If I had more room, I probably would factor a 2x out of the numerator. Hey, I took a shortcut because I know that when I go on to calculus that I'm going to need um, to be able to do some things faster than I've had to so far. Um, if you can take this shortcut and get the right answer, yay, use it. If you can't, then write down every single step. You just need to do it on other paper. Um, since I knew that LCD was x minus 2 times x plus 4, I knew I'd have to multiply this fraction by x plus 4 over x plus 4, and this one by x minus 2 over x minus 2. So you may have written that step down, and if you need it, that's absolutely fine. But the reason I can skip it is I know if I'm multiplying this by x plus 4 times x plus 4, it's really just the same as multiplying x times x plus 4 gives me this, and 7x times x minus 2 gives me this with, with a middle step skipped. Hey, why didn't I multiply both sides by the whole LCD or both, both fractions by the whole LCD? That's when, I'm, that's when I have an equation. I don't, I'm not solving an equation here. That's when I'm trying to cancel out the denominators I'm not trying to cancel out the denominators here. I'm trying to make them both have the same denominator. What about f of x times g of x? x over x minus 2 times 7x over x plus 4. <coughs> not really anything exciting to do there. You can multiply the numerators and multiply the denominators but that's about it. And I would just leave that denominator in factored form. How about f of x divided by g of x? How do you divide to g 
just f of x <clears throat> times the reciprocal of g of x. Anything I can do before I multiply there? <coughs> Would it be legal to cancel these two x's? Nope, those are terms. Would it be legal to cancel those two x's? Yes, those are factors. So x plus 4 over 7 times x minus 2. The domain of f plus g and f minus g and f times g, anything I can put in this one, anything I can put in this one, I can put in any of those three um, operational functions. So what's the domain of f plus g, f minus g, and f times g? Everything but 2 and negative 4. Now see, actually, let me make this point. Actually, this product, could I could I let x be negative 4 in this function? I could. I get 0, but that's okay. Um, however, the domain has to be anything that you can put into both of those original functions. So you still can't have the 2 or the negative four. It can't be in the sum, the difference, or the quotient function if it can't be in the original function. Yeah, what about that? Yeah, I did just point at it. Um, even though I could let x be negative 4 in this, I still couldn't let x be negative 4 in this. Yeah. So that domain is going to be the same. Because it's going to be divided by 7x over x plus 4. Right. Right. Um, so these two are going to be the same. Should x not even be 0? Um, but that, so what is that blowing up? F or G or the quotient? In this? Um, can X be zero in this expression? Yes. But, okay, I see where you're talking about. Um, that's not a problem because that's not the original function. This is the original function. As long as it doesn't blow up this, or this, or this, then it can be in the domain. All right. Nothing terribly exciting about that. Yes. Uh, but since it's x over x minus 2, all that over 7x over x plus 4, could it not be 0 because then the bottom of it's, I think that's the same question. Yeah, but, 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 okay, so if you have it, you have it written still in a uh, fraction. Fraction. Yeah, yeah. This and fraction you, over that fraction. Yes, that's correct. And then if you plug in zero for x, the bottom will come out of zero, correct? Um, so the bottom of the bottom. Yeah, I get what you're saying answer. now. I'm thinking real hard about it. Because, because you're saying uh, if you wrote that over that, before you simplified it, you couldn't put zero into it. Because if you put zero into yeah, the bottom, I see. You I have see now. Come out with zero and then have zero I see. Zero and zero I'm thinking about it. That's a very good point that I haven't thought of before. When you say, <clears throat> I think I'm fixing to have to um, take back something I said. Let me tell you, in case you're not sure what's being talked about here, if I write f of x over g of x, before I take the reciprocal and turn it to multiplication, 
I have x over x minus 2 divided by 7x over x plus 4. Right? Okay. Can I let x be 0 in that expression? What would I have in the denominator if I did? It would be, it would be 0 divided by 0. And in calculus 2, we're going to find out that's indeterminate form. You can't really say much about 0 divided by 0. Don't worry about it now. But 0 in the denominator cannot be allowed to happen. You're just, you, you brought up an excellent question. When I say that this equals what it simplifies to, and what it simplifies to is this. <clears throat> We've talked about when we say one, one fraction equals another fraction, if I cancel out some factor, I have to account for that and say this equals this for all values except for zero. Those two actually are not equivalent if x is zero. Zero here is not a problem, but zero here is a huge problem. So these two expressions are equal for all values except for zero, and that means zero can't be in the domain. Wow. I haven't thought of that before, and so I tell you what I'm going to do. No, I'm going to, ah, I keep forgetting to bring a highlighter in here. Hold on. And I'm just going to put a big square around it. But it could be, but it could be in the domain of the, of the other one, right? Of the plus, plus and the minus and minus. Yes. So they're yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking through. I just wrote it in the wrong place. Okay. All right, all right. <laughs> all right. Listen to me. Stop talking for just one second. Actually, stop talking for the next 25 minutes to yourself. Um. I am going to think about that. I I know that's right. I'm just wondering why I've never thought of that before. And I want to look at the definition in the book. Something's, something's just nagging at me. And when something's nagging at me, even if this is right, and I'm fairly confident it is, um, I want to think about it some more in my office and say something else about it tomorrow to clarify the confusion that has been. All right, I just want to clarify, I'm 99.9% .9 sure that that's right, but I want to be 100%. So we're going to talk about that again tomorrow. All right, the last thing that is in this section, and the last thing that's on the test, may not be the last problem on the test, but it's the last concept we're covering that's on the test, is the depth, the, um, idea of a composite function. A composite function is when you build one machine that does the job of two people. For example, if you had an adding two machine, you're going to put in a number, it's going to add two, spit out an answer. But then you have another machine that's going to take that answer and add seven more Instead of an adding two machine and an adding seven machine, you could just build a what? And that would be the composite function, the function that does the job of both. So the notation for that, actually there's two notations that can be used. One is this little circle notation. When you see F circle G of X, if you like the other notation better, you could write that Take g of x and put it into f. In this, in this notation, it's the function closest to the x. You're taking that expression and putting it into the other one. And in my opinion, that's a little bit more clear in this notation. This takes g of x, whatever it is. In this case, what's g of x? 3x. You just take 3x 
and put it into the function f. Well, I know what this means. This means wherever there's an x in the function f, what am I going to put in its place? 3x. And I'm going to be careful and use parentheses as I need to. 3x in parentheses cubed plus 2 times 3x in parentheses squared. And then clean that up as much as possible. That's 27x cubed plus 18x squared. Now, unfortunately, when you build a composite function, dude in the middle of the two machines gets fired. So this is a forced reduction. We need fewer people if we're not going to have a middle machine anymore. Let's check this with some number. If, if I put, let's say I put 2 into g of x, what would g of x fit out? A 6. If I took that 6 and put it into f, that would be um, 216 plus 72 is 288, maybe? All right, if I took this 6 and put it here, I'd get 288. Is 288 what I'd get if I put it in the composite function? I'd have to grab a calculator, but 8 times 27 is... 116, 56, 216 plus 72. Yep, it's the same thing either way. So we have built a machine that does both of these jobs without having to have somebody catch the number coming out of G of X and put it into the next machine. Yes? Um, only if you substitute a number that's not in the domain of the composite function. If the composite function, if neither one of the original functions is a fraction, but the composite function turns out to be a fraction, you'll have to watch out for what makes the denominator zero in that composite. Otherwise, it's short. All right. Um, do you think that the compositions of functions is commutative. That means, do you think that putting g into f of x will give you the same answer as putting f into g of x? Uh, not sure. We can do one example and see. Here's what this notation means. <laughs> Take f of x and put it into g. What's f of x? It's x cubed plus 2x squared. So what are we, where are we going to put that x cubed plus 2x squared? In the place of x in the function g. So just 3 times x cubed plus 2x squared is 3x cubed plus 6x squared. Do you think that would give you the same value as that if you put a 2 in it? No, not at all. So composition of functions is not commutative. f of g of x doesn't give you the same thing uh, as g of f of x. Now, in the C part, f of g of negative 2, what is that telling us to do? What does that mean to do? Negative 2 into g of x, that give us negative 6, and then put negative 6 into f of x. But since we built one machine that does the job of both of those, should it give us the same answer if we just plug the negative 2 into the A part. It should. That was the whole point. Yes, ma'am. 
Don't type to me. Why did you multiply by three x? Because the I put I put this in place of the x. You know what? What you just said would be the answer to a different question. It's the right answer to a different question. What you said would actually be. Um, Actually, this, yeah, which would be different. No, not that, but this. All right, so we could neglect the middleman approach, put the negative two into G, that give us a negative six, and we can put a negative six into F, but the whole point of this composition of functions is to save us that middle step so I'm going to put <coughs> negative 2 into the answer that I got in the A part. That's, that's a weird looking negative 2 right there if you're wondering. That would be 27 times negative 2 cubed plus 18 times negative 2 squared. That's negative 8 times 27 is negative 216. And that's 4 times 18 is 72. <coughs> so negative 144. <coughs> And what does this G of F of 3 mean? If I didn't know anything about composition of functions, I would take the 3 and do what? Plug it into F. That would give me a 8 plus 18 is 26. What would I do with that 26? Plug it into G. But I have this machine that does both of those things. So I just need to take the 3 and put it into the composition function that I got as the answer to the B part. And that would be 3 times 3 cubed plus 6 times 3 squared, which is 81 plus 54 which is 135. Okay. Any questions? All right. Just two more. Number 26. You go ahead and find the A and the B part there. Find F of G of X and G of F of X. The A part means, right? And so I take that square root of X plus 2 and put it in place of um, X in the function F. Put this in the place of that. <clears throat> Thank you. 
That's ugly and not, there's not a lot I can do to clean it up. Yeah, that's just ugly. In my opinion, that would not make it look any less bad. It would look equally bad. It would be right, and I'd count it right, but I wouldn't say it would be something. It would be hard to solve. Oh, but it's not an equation. How could you solve it because it's not an equation? That's evaluate. That's not solve. I'm going to make a good tutor of you. I'm going to get those right words in your kid. Yeah, I can't solve that because it's not an equation, but I could evaluate it for given values of x. I expect the b part to be just as ugly. B of f of x means take f of x, whatever it is, and put that in the place of x in the function g. I have square root of square root of 3 minus x plus 2. Not really anything I can do to simplify that. All right. This one, you can do some cleaning up. Or both composite functions and then simplify them as much as possible. Is that what you got before you simplified either complex fraction? How do you simplify this first complex fraction? X over X. Multiply it by X over X and make sure you distribute that X to all one, two, three terms. What'd you get? To um, simplify this complex fraction, actually two ways you can think about it. You can think about it like we did the a part, multiplied by x minus 2 over x minus 2 to clear out the fractions. What else could you have done? Three times x minus 2 over x. Multiply by the reciprocal would give you the same thing. All right, last problem in any good math class is always a word problem. A spherical balloon is being inflated at a rate of nine halves pi cubic feet per minute. What is that nine halves pi cubic feet per minute a measure of? Volume. 
if it's cubic feet per minute, actually the cubic feet is the volume and the cubic feet per minute is a rate of change in volume. All right, so the volume, um, ooh, I almost accidentally wrote down calculus. This would be easy to write down in calculus. Um, let's see. The change in volume in calculus, we're going to call it either triangle V for change in volume, or we'll figure out what this means, change in volume. Change in volume with respect to time will look like that. But that's calculus. We're not in calculus yet. So I gotta keep up with these words. The change in the volume is nine halves pi um, cubic feet per minute What's the change in volume in T minutes? It is nine halves pi every minute. Then in T minutes, what's the change in volume? Nine yeah. In two minutes, it would just be nine pi. In six minutes, it'd be 27 pi. In 10 minutes, it'd be 45 pi. In T minutes, it's nine halves pi t. So I'm going to say it's volume in terms of time is nine halves pi t. Now, we don't want its volume in terms of time. We want its radius in terms of time. Well, do I know anything about the radius of this? Spherical balloon? There's a formula for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the volume of a sphere. So we have volume in terms of time. We have volume in terms of radius. How could we get radius in terms of time? So if nine if nine halves pi is the volume, then we take four times pi over two. So we then add it to it and get twenty twenty and twenty and four thirds pi over two four nine halves pi. No, nine halves pi is the volume in just one minute. It's not just the volume, period. It's the volume in one minute. So you can't just plug in nine halves pi. Yeah, that's a good thought. It's got to be something with composite functions because um, that's what we're doing right now.
Yeah, that's just telling us that it started flat. <laughs> So you're saying solve this for R? Okay. Yeah, we can solve that for R. Okay. So you're trying to find a correlation between the right? Uh-huh. So What if I didn't have function notation there? I just had V. Okay. So then you can yeah. If this gives you the volume and this gives you the volume, so, then this equals this. That, that's just, that's it. That's not V times T. That's V of T. I'm just saying V of T, it's the volume. It's the volume. This is the volume at time T. This is the volume in terms of radius. So if this equals V and this equals V, then this equals that. And we want radius in terms of time. That means solve for R or solve for T. Solve for R. So R cubed would be nine halves pi T divided by four thirds pi. The pi's would cancel. Nine halves divided by four thirds is 27 eighths. And it's even easy to take the cube root. Yeah, cube root of t or t to the one third. The radius is three halves of the cube root of t. So t, let's say in eight seconds, what will the radius be? Three what? Three feet. Yep. That's it. All right. So tomorrow, here's tonight's homework, 2.7 right here. Um, tomorrow is just ask questions from anywhere you have them. If you could, from the practice test, from any of those optional worksheets, um, I guess that's the two biggest things you have. All right, see ya. I want to see what you I don't know. I want to think about you to do it anyway. I have calculus, calculus this spring. I just found out yesterday is Monday through Thursday, eight to eight fifty-five. So just an hour earlier than this. I got here earlier. <laughs> it's going to cut out my workout. I work out from 5 to 5.30. I'm not getting up at 4.30 to run on the elliptical. I'm sorry, what? Yeah, I'm not getting up at 4.30 to run on the elliptical. Well, we no longer even have the standalone trig class because pre-calculus is half trig. The yeah, second half of pre-calculus is trig. Yeah.